Cassian Adler. The Empire is choking us so slowly. We're starting not to notice. What I'm asking is this. Wouldn't you rather give it all to something real? We got another shot talk. Back in the chair. I'm sitting in my like living room because my wife's out of town. So finally, I got relegated to the big house. Uh, <laughs> and I got a super excited, super exciting show today. Because uh, we're going to talk about Andor, the Disney show, Star Wars Adventure. And uh, I've got the whole team here. I've got Adriana Goldman, who uh, shot, the, shot the show and shot six episodes, uh, including the first three, and then eight, nine, and ten. And then we've got the production designer, Luke Hull, and uh, the costume designer, Michael Wilkinson, who I worked with 20 years ago on Garden State. So <laughs> it's exciting to see you again and just to talk about this wonderful show you guys did. Um, and we'll just get into it. You know, I, I obviously grew up on Star Wars, as everybody who's around my age, 50 and all that. And I'm not one of those people that has watched all the animated series and has done like every, you know, I mean, there Star Wars is, I was thinking about it yesterday. I was thinking, gosh, you know, to think that a, a franchise could start in the mid seventies and still have resonance and still basically have continuity all the way to today and continuing forward. And one of the biggest things, and I'll start with you, Luke, because it felt like such a daunting thing. Because one of the, the great things about this show, which is on Disney, as you guys know, and it's really uh, a show about a thief and an orphan and a rebel, Diego Luna, who's three names. And he, uh, it, it, you follow him through these, this incredible world. And Luke, when I think about starting this show, because at least from, from doing research, and you can tell me how you got involved. It's not like you were you were doing all of these other Star Wars films. The world building and sort of both maintaining some level of continuity with the canon of Star Wars and some things that you could research and figure out like, well, this is what's been established and we can use this as a leaping off point. But then brand new things, brand new places, brand new, you know, environments, planets, all these things. Where do you start? I mean, it literally, it was mind numbing and, and really sort of stressful <laughs> for me to even conceive of what's like day one. What's day one? For it's, you even, it's even worse than that. I think that the, um, I was supposed to move <laughs> to New York and do another job. And then I met Tony, pretty much made that decision on the call with him um, <laughs> to go and make a Star Wars show essentially that didn't have to feel Star Wars, which I thought was a pretty good brief. Uh, no idea how we do that. At the time, we didn't really have scripts either. So that very early days was like being in a in a writer's room and then kind of hitting the ground running from that with a view to kind of shooting. That was November with a view to shooting in April. Thank God COVID kind of delayed us a little. But um, the, yeah, no, it was, in some ways it was probably good because we were moving fast. So you weren't overthinking it. I think if I'm honest about it now, like I guess I never took on the show either, like you yourself. Like I'd seen the original movies, uh, but I'd not I'd fallen away from Star Wars. I'm not a massive Star Wars fan, and so I think there was something very enticing about trying to find the human, very very human aspect of Tony's writing, and putting that into something up that's up to now has been pretty much all to do with fighting big battles in space and things like that. And he's taking, you know, his writing brings it very much down to a character level, a very domestic level. And it, it's not, it's, it's sort of tried to say like, oh, it's uh, uh, the hardest thing to do is to figure out like what someone's apartment would look like in Star Wars or what someone's bathroom would look like. It's not so much that actually. It's almost fine. It was trying to find a an overall kind of human logic and, and, and an approach to the project, which actually, you know, ended up being building a lot of sets basically that would allow us to kind of walk through them with our characters and not feel like we're cutting from a piece of concept art to a piece of concept art or something like this. Um, so it was about, it was kind of an, the approach was kind of like how you'd approach any project actually, like you'd research. Right. Or like, like there was no, no movies or TV shows before it, like just where would you start if you had nothing? Well, exactly. Yeah. I mean, with this, there's a certain amount of research on the basis, like, you know, 
you always kind of find that balance of where you know where you want to jump off. Like you don't want to, you, you adhere to enough rules to be able to break these ones. Um, yes. And so like that, that took a while. And I think that took the whole project. I think Michael and Najana would agree, like <laughs> constantly finding this, this, what is, what is this we're doing? And, uh, yeah. Until it sort of makes sense, um, you know, right down to like, you know, is we just, is, is this just overdressed for the sake of it? Or, or, you know, is this set just slick for the sake of it? You know, sometimes you have to kind of, um, I think I listen in a lot of people, it was quite interesting, like a lot of people that we brought in, it was a real good mix. Like it was people who hadn't really worked on any Star Wars and people who had worked on like all the movies in the art department, I mean. And so, and it was quite interesting. You start to see that there was a, there's a kind of, this is how we do things. Which I really yeah. liked. And <laughs> within that, like it was in that fight, you found a, we found our language. I think, but anyway, I could talk. Well, fashion. and also, and also, there's there are those people, which is always hard. I've done a little bit of comic book stuff, and anything that has canon and anything that has history and has such an attachment to the fans, mm. you also want to be respectful of that, and also have to sort of play by some rules because there are some things that have been established that, you know, it, they'll notice when you, uh, when you oh, shake yeah, the it fan, up. The fan base is terrifying. It's always in the back of our mind. <laughs> but I think what we were trying to do was like, like you said, like a lot of that fan base has now grown up and they want something yes. a little bit more meat on the bone of what like Star Wars is or what these stories are. And, and that, you know, I guess it's an instinct thing. It's like, what do I want to watch as well? Like, what do I want to see? Like, I want this level of, interest and detail and and i and and it not just be i don't know i don't want to diminish other projects at all we're just a very different beast because of the way tony writes i think but um it it i guess we just came at it from a different angle and there was always a risk that, that people would reject it but i think generally while as we were making it it, it we were trying to draw more people in rather than just hit the fan base so like well, yes. I constantly found myself saying, like, no, we're not going to flip through the Argos catalog of what Star Wars has and go, well, we'll put one of these in here and one of that and then let's throw a bank over there. That's not what we're doing. You know, it, it's there if it needs to be there. And we'll draw on Absolutely. it. Absolutely. But, I mean, there's so many case examples I could go on and on, but I won't. But, like, it, yeah, it really is like every project. You build it like a collage. And, it, you know, and you've got this – TV projects are such a long span as well. It's not like a movie where you've kind of got to do all your prep and then put it up. And it's you, – you are finding it every day, every set you turn over. Um, yes, of course. Of you, course. Until the end you go, oh, wait. <laughs> That's how we're doing it. Okay. <laughs> and, I mean, and there are just so many sets in this in this show. I mean, there's so many – different you know sort of environments and locations and stuff like that michael you know one thing i also was when i was watching the show and i've got of course this seems obvious but i was like there's nothing one you can't like go you know i'm making a period piece of the 1890s west you go okay i can look at photography i can look at paintings i can look at this it's like besides some star wars stuff but similarly what i just talked to luke about was there's not that much reference from this specific stuff because it's all brand new things is there's not a stitch of anything somebody can wear in this show that could be bought off the rack. Like, I know that seems obvious, but it was <laughs> at some point it really sort of caught me because I was really paying attention to every single background, every single lead character and going, oh, no, there's nothing here. It's not like, so where does the research and where does the, where do you start again? Similarly, when you sort of begin a project like this, um, and, 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 and what is that experience like a little bit? I mean, I think the prospect of doing costumes for a show this size, when there's so many episodes, so many hours of, of product to make, it's both overwhelming, terrifying, and so, and so thrilling. Um, but I knew as soon as I met with, um, Tony, that it was going to be, a, as Luke was saying, a different type of Star Wars. You know, he had such a detailed, cool, complex approach to his, to writing his characters. There was nothing two-dimensional about these people. They were all kind of messed up, searching for things, um, having these elaborate double lives. Everyone was in disguise and stuff. So he was such a fascinating um, kind of a 
project to approach. And then you have, of course, the 45 years of Star Wars history that has come before you and the incredible work of all costume designers that have contributed to this now wonderful language of a pre-established Star Wars costume sort of uh, vocabulary. But I think, uh, like Luke, what what was for, exciting for me is to sort of where to leap off, where to sort of say, okay, this is what an Imperial Guard looks like. We all know that. Let's Let's pop that there as a placeholder for like, this is... This is putting the audience squarely in a Star Wars world. Then does that give us liberty to really leap off with some of the other new um, ca characters that we haven't seen before and be get really creative with what they look like and what their details are? So I think, you know, one of the rules that Tony was talking about was like all of the costume ch choices really had to be character driven and not sort of just ornamental or because they looked cool or because that's how it's done in the Star Wars universe at all had to come from a, yeah, like a, like you would approach any costume design gig. It would be like, okay, what's the, what are you trying to say about the character in this scene? Are they feel are they having a good day? Are they having a bad day? Are they hiding from the world? Are they feeling bold? Are they all of those sort of, you know, colors, textures, silhouettes, all that stuff that we, that we play with all the time. So it was, yeah, it was both familiar ground in that way and also wildly exciting new territory. Well, to you talk about the silhouette, you know, the silhouette of Mon, like uh, with the long sleeves and like they, there's a, a, there's one where she's walking away from camera in that beautiful silhouette and then she takes off that top with the long sleeves. And I was like, oh my God, that's incredible. But you think also that episode where depressed Cyril and his mom are, he's getting ready for his interview and he's talking about the brown suit and what the collar means. And there's so yeah. much specificity to the clothing in this show. And the, in fact, that the character's it's representative. It's like when you're a thief, you have to like then put on the clothing of an Imperial Guard or you have to you have mm -hmm. to actually like it's it's such a vibrant part of the rebels and the thieves and the and the, the you know, the, the senators and the mm -hmm. aristocracy and all of that. It's it's not just, you know, it's really has has emotional resonance in the episodes mm -hmm. as well. Oh, thank you. I feel like working with Tony, he's, it's so golden for a costume designer because he, he writes, he writes with the look of the character in mind and the backstory. And he's not prescriptive. It's not like she is wearing a red coat, but he sort of drops little, in the little hints into the scripts. And then that gives you enough to sort of run and fly with ideas. But I think the challenge for me was, we, we go to so many different worlds in this, in this season. We go to about seven or eight different planets and each have to be so sharply defined as we cut from one to the other. So you're going from the, you know, the very beautifully dressed Coruscant worlds to, you know, primitive Canary where the, the sort of Lord of the Flies, um, uh, children are running loose in the jungle. Uh, we go to a, a sterile prison and each time the costumes have to sort of make sense uh, in each of those worlds and tell, tell the audience about what sort of resources and what sort of technologies and what sort of histories each of these worlds have. So that's when working with Luke and Adriana has been so amazing because we would geek out together and talk about, you know, what sort of technologies do they have? Do they have, uh, you know, uh, is it post-industrial? Is that, you know, do they, uh, do they, are the, is the other world stratified? Do they have lots of light? What materials are they making their buildings out of? What materials are they making their clothes out of? It's all this really like, you know, ground roots level thinking about all of these different societies. And so it becomes a very rich and complex uh, dialogue, but the sort of thing that we all love getting our teeth into. Yeah, well, that's, I think also what was beautiful about the original Star Wars and what has resonated for 45 years is that there's archetypes to the, to, and it was it also what makes it so so resonant, right? It's like the struggles, the resistance, the powerful, the the weak, all of that. But that they're represented. The factory workers feel like they all are cut in sort of similar cloths of the way they dress. The the aristocracy, the whites, the grays, the blues, you know, and the multicolors of the of the of the people that are sort of on the lower end, you know, the sort of pastiche of that. And in that, I think, has such a world building effect of the coordination of all three of your departments in the way it really works together in the way that you want any job and you want any film and any project to do, which is to coordinate all the efforts so that you really understand 
that all three of you guys are really talking to each other. Um, and so, okay, so I'm going to come back to each of you guys because we're also going to watch a couple clips and talk about them more specifically. But all right, Adriano, so you got involved. Tell me what, uh, what also was your <laughs> first thought and, and what, how did it, like, what was that, 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 that first day for you when you said, okay, how am I going to attack this? And, and where do you start to sort of focus your energy in those early days of research and, and, uh, and prep? Um, well, very much like Luke and Michael felt, uh, when I f- was first approached by Senna and Tony, I, th- I think I, I feel a little bit luckier than them because there was something when they approached me. There were, I, I could read some scripts, right? So it was a little bit more advanced in terms of like the, the, what, it, what was the size of the job, the task. And, but, but still kind of, it, it felt a little bit too big and overwhelming. I had never done sci-fi or, or fantasy before. So, you know, and also coming from years on a show like The Crown, I, 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 remember, I remember having good fun thinking, it's like you said, Larry, it, when you research for period or even like contemporary films or, 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 or series, the, the things exist. Right, so you want to see a location. You go to the location. You want to okay. see the costume. The costume is there. So I realized when I stepped in that nothing existed, nothing up at all. I mean, Luke had a, had floor plans. Michael had some concept drawings. I mean, so it was like, oh, so, so so how do I prep if there's no locations to go or there's nothing actually physical to 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 be researched to be, you know, uh, co- because. You, I think we all, uh, and again, I insist be, probably because that was the first time I was dealing with sci-fi and fantasy. It is pr- pretty much, I think this is the reality behind of any other shows like, you know, Star Wars or when involved sci-fi or futuristic elements or whatever. But for me, that was really new. And I was like, I really felt kind of uneasy about it. Um, then like Luke said, I'm, I've never been a massive Star Wars fan. But I am a fan of Rogue One. I really, really liked when I watched Rogue One and how real and how touchable and how um, uh, believable the whole environment was. And so, again, I felt very lucky, not only because I had read some scripts and it really felt this this was a show for grown-ups and the politics, like you said, and so many layers involved that I could even, like, myself could understand a little bit better how the empire works and what is it actually behind i've also felt very lucky because i always loved stories about uh let's say below the line i'm gonna i'm gonna say below <laughs> the line characters you know like the backstage of the massive star wars series like people the guys making pieces of machinery to, to then, so the mystery behind the factory yes. and the prison and what are those guys building that now makes more, much more sense to me. So I basically, my, for my prep, I based, based my prep, even the technical prep in terms of like selecting lenses and et cetera. I started from Rogue One. So I, re, I was really interested on what Greg Fraser had used. So I didn't have to go through an entire, uh, um, research and also i didn't want to test too much just because i had to, I, I really wanted to spend be able to spend more time with luke and michael and in the office with you know toby haynes the director that directed the first three so there was a lot of conversations and you know this imagination that we all had to somehow put together different tastes and uh, so it was really challenging, but, but was such a gig for me. And, you know, the, the, the amount of, le- of stuff that I had to learn, to learn throughout prep and in the previous stuff, you know, so you don't have a set, but you can be- eventually walk through a set and understand the dimensions for the prison. For instance, it was very hard to imagine the size of the, or the, or the main factory floor. So I, I don't know. It was completely new to me, but it was so, um, fulfilling in a sense, very challenging, very exhausting. I mean, I was actually, I basically, I was actually hired throughout during the, the lockdown months. So, you know, all, all through Zoom, Zoom calls and I talked to Sen a couple times. I, then I decided to do it. And then suddenly you were out of the lockdown, starting on something that is 
absolutely new in terms of prep, in terms of um, overall uh, conception, a different team, different showrunner. Uh, but it was just um, an um, just amazing. I mean, I, I, I insist exhausting, but you know, because because of the challenge, I, I'd say yeah. the challenge was super, very, very overwhelming. I think for for all of us. But I think the the level of realism that we all wanted to uh, put on the screen. Uh, I remember Tony Gilroy saying, "I just I want to be able to feel their breath. I want to be able to feel to see the dust in the air." So I, I have to believe these characters. I have to believe the locations. And Luke uh, just gave us that. I mean, we basically shot an entire sci-fi film, uh, fiction, uh, series on location. Yeah, That's, so that, just- I re- that I sensed and felt really strongly because, um, you know, in the in the in the new sort of like modern canon of Star Wars, and particularly Disney Plus and the series Mandalorian. And the incredible sort of innovative work of volume work and all that, that I almost feel like when I think Star Wars now, I think, oh, well, they just shoot on the volume. And I went, wait, wait, this feels like I'm in physical sets almost every single scene. I was like trying to find like, wow, they must have done a little volume work there. Maybe they did. It was like, I was like, but then I started going, no, it just feels like this is actually a physical built world versus kind of this, you know, future, which is volumes incredible and all those sort of techniques. Um, and so I want to speak a little bit dovetailing off of yours into the prep, uh, and how you guys used, whether it was previs, unreal, building sets virtually, and then sort of using that in your prep, because I think that's such a modern way of, uh, of prepping films, particularly these kind of films where, like you say, you're not going to a specific location and going with a location scout and picking one of three offices to shoot in. Um, so w- I want, Maybe Luke, you can tell me a little bit about how you started with your team to help help build. What was that? No, I think you need two things that we didn't have from the get go. One is like, well, a if you want to use the volume, I think you've got to write for the volume. That that's right. like that out. Like the volume is an interesting piece of kit. It's a very expensive piece of kit, and I don't want to get into the details about it. But like, if you're not using it enough on your project for the right reasons, then it's just a very expensive in camera VFX. So the what I was interesting about, uh, well, and it was a personal like approach as well. Like we only used, and I think that John, you agree when you would use very little green screen, we only used it where we, where it was an opportunity to, to show more Extend the set. Than well. not, yeah. not as a, as a way of achieving the goal. I mean, very rarely. I mean, we, I think we've got one very excellent CGI sequence, courtesy of Mo and Leo, who's brilliant uh, in there, where it's just loose and shit. But other than that, we're, we wanted something that felt tangible. Um, but the the previs side of things, I, I mean, I'd love to do it more. I'd love to give it more. I'd love Adriano to have had that more, for example. But what you need is time up front and you need a slightly yes. different art department to be able to do it. So so we we did it we did it to a point, didn't we, Adriano? And I think on season two we're doing it much better, but we were so pushed for time as a department that Whilst we mo- I model everything up front anyway, like even the stuff we're not building, so we understand how it sits in the world, and then we try and get it up to the effects, and then from there you can pre-visit. So, but I would have liked to have been able to do that more on this season one. So exactly for the reason I was saying, it wasn't quite so terrifying for him where I'm going like, but look at this white card model, isn't it lovely? Uh, <laughs> in some ways, just even our prep was probably more. Uh, I wouldn't say antiquated, but like um, classical, <laughs> I suppose. Like there was a lot yeah. of, you know, models. There was a lot of, a um, lot of, con- like, we did do a lot of concept work. There were usually shop based concepts as well, like keyframe concepts and things. So we could really get the feel for it because Tony isn't always in the country. And a lot of that really helped sell a, a, a set. But also it was to do with an approach like Ferrix, for example. I mean, we joke about how we built a town on the back top, but we kind of did. And the reason we did that was, and I sort of learned this on other projects, when you start to, you know, it's like a conglomerate of 32 sets. And when you start to not think about them as like individual stage sets and start to think how they could all feed into one another to give you more opportunities when you're when you're on that town. So you can walk up the street and turn left and go into Marvas and out and over to Zamwans or, you know, that that I think is real screen value for a TV show that you can't always achieve on a film as well. So um, 
And that's the kind of tangibility, I guess, and the exploration that I wanted to offer. And, and it's that's very hard to pre up front unless you've got a lot more time. I, I think once the set started going up, Adriana, I guess, it, and particularly when you came back to it, it, it probably made more sense. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> time on the day, mm-hmm. shooting issue as well. But like, uh, I think, I think it, it's a stark difference. I, I'd say we have more time on season two now not necessarily scripts, but we have more time to actually flesh out the sets, put them into into v, uh, VFX and, and, and allow some previs. But we're not doing it in the way that they're doing it in Manhattan Studios, where it's right. in pipeline, if you like, because it's just, it, it's volume. I mean, we have so much, but also you lose track of it. I've got to say, from a design point of view, like, again, it's sort of like, I don't, you finish the set the day you shoot it. And I don't mean that for you. I mean, you really do. You run out of time on every set. For me, yes. like to, yes. to be in a position where I'd be like, oh, that's the set signed off four weeks prior. That's what it is. I think you're missing opportunities constantly. So I, it's, I think that's such an important thing. I learned this myself on, on Black Adam because we started thinking we were going to do so much volume work and we ended up building basically everything. Mm-hmm. was. Uh, it's hard to have, make... <laughs> I know this also from working on Joker and all these other films is you kind of want the flexibility to keep changing it up until the last minute. And that, that idea that you have to lock something in is so hard for any creative to do, let alone directors and showrunners and to have everything locked and loaded is really tricky. It's not that we can't make decisions. It's that the process of being creative is fluid. And so it's, it's, I think that's, that's one of the tricky things, you know, that we said, well, let's, let's jump into some imagery. Cause I think that's also like, um, you know, the, the thing that really drives, drives the conversations, you know, early in this episode, this sort of, uh, interview between Cyril, um, and, 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 you know, where, <laughs> this is a great dynamic, these two, uh, and he's he's a character that is it's he's he's a very memorable character this sort of sad sack uh ambitious kid uh but this is a great example of of something i've always said you know when i think about well hey, i'm gonna start with michael because there's something here that that really struck me okay i kept thinking in these universes that you guys build across the across the world is it's this kind of you know, old and new world, you know, you've got weird televisions that look like they're from the 80s, but you also have incredible technology allows you to go to light speed and all these kind of things. And I kept thinking as a costume designer, uh, you know, you get to have a chance to actually reinvent something that has existed for years and years and years. And I went, oh, you re- basically reinvented the tie. And I and just tell me a little bit about this, because I thought it was incredible. Uh, this, and, and I was like, this should exist. Well, I have to start off saying this is one of my favorite sort of couples in in the show. There's such an unlikely dynamic. It should never work. And yet somehow there's this weird energy between the two where they have some sort of common ground, whether it's their fastidiousness or their precision or their, their incredible, they're both driven characters that are just want to push things through right to the bitter end. Um, but I love how they their relationship develops um, over the series. And so for Cyril, you know, very early in the show, he's established, established as a person who really cares about his personal appearance when he's in his uniform early. There's a comment that he's specifically sort of tailored his uniform to look the way he wants to look. He he knows the power of of, co- of clothing and how it affects how people feel about yourself. So he always brings this precision and this fastidiousness to his clothing. So for his look, we were sort of reinventing sort of what is bureaucratic, what is corporate uh, in the world of Star Wars, because he works at this quite a low level office uh, called the Bureau, Bureau of Statistics within the Empire. Uh, and so we, Tony's brief was like, what's corporate? What's, what's, uh, what's bureaucratic in Star Wars. So we looked at this kind of world of 50 shades of gray. All of his coworkers are just endless gray tones of gray upon gray. Uh, and then I came across this idea of, uh, you know, the man in the suit needs a tie. What does that mean to us? So we um, came up with this idea of tucking the tie into the uh, precision made uh, opening in his shirt. So that's how that, that came. Uh, that's, that's brilliant. All right, so wait. 
what would you also? Hey, all right, I'm going to give you my thing, and then you can tell me if you have ever had to reinvent it or if you could. Uh, it's just underwear, right? And go, you guys have reinvented the way. Like there, it's it's like almost the silhouette of like the wide under the hips sort of like flow. Almost looks like a skirt, but it's a pant. All these kind of things, the long sleeves, all these incredible sort of reinventions and and rethinkings of future and and past uh, a wardrobe and costume design. Underwear, like how do you reinvent that? What Interesting. We- is there underwear in space? Who knows? Who well, knows? this is like there's that, one, there's that the early episode, you know, with Tim and and where they 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 kiss and you know obviously they just go off in the distance and the next morning she wakes up and I was thinking, oh wait, maybe there's a new future underwear that's uh, that's going to be invented. So even if you have it, I feel like that's the next challenge, uh, which is to reinvent that because uh, it's like you know it's kind of you know, existed pretty consistently, at least for like, you know, a certain number of years now. I think it leads into a, a general topic that Tony really wanted the a layered approach to the, 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 the costumes in this and the fact that we do see people take off layers, which is actually quite um, groundbreaking for Star Wars. You know, when you think of Star Wars costume, you have, you know, Darth Vader in his black armor, yes. Princess Leia in her white robe. But he wanted us to really throw away that idea that, it's it's gonna it's clothes. It's not costuming. And so with clothes, you have layers. You get home, you take layers off. You might go down to your tank top or your space underwear. You what what do you look like when you close the door in your apartment from the world disappears and you're just in that space? We've never really seen that in Star Wars before. And so there were so many moments in this in this uh, series where we had to think about the clothes in a very layered way and to make them just as real and authentic. Uh, as possible, and at the same time, not bring attention to themselves, which is such a challenge when you're working on Star Wars. Your your first impulse is to, to design these unforgettable, iconic costumes that are just going to leap off the screen. Uh, and in fact, you know, Tony really encouraged us all to to pull back and to only design things that were practical, authentic. They had a reason for being, uh, and I think that really helps you. F- care about these people as these characters as real people and not just sort of um, two dimensional ideas of a person. But it's similarly, and this is what's beautiful about the writing and the construction of the characters and how you guys blend with it is you are aware, aware of it in the human way, like, you know, in episode six or whatever, when they're, they're, you know, they're getting ready for the, for when they steal all the credits and stuff, but he's, he can't quite fit his belt his around. He can't fit it around his stomach because, you know, he's obviously <laughs> gotten a bit fat. And I was like, it's such a prank. And he's like, yeah, he's 10 years old. He can dress himself. So the dressing and the sort of preparation of getting, getting, you know, is such a part of humanity and such a part of being human. And that it was really lovely to see it even, you know, represented in the characters and the way they have to deal with their own clothing, you know? And and that's, I, I think, also felt unique uh, mm. and, and something I hadn't seen before, certainly in Star Wars movies. You know, there was even the iconic moment where um, Dedra, I think at one stage, uh, loosens the tunic of her Imperial uniform, which was like, yes. oh my God, this is groundbreaking. <laughs> Never been. Exactly. What do, what exactly. Even underneath the uniform. What so we got it to- is Larry, like like Luke said, uh, there's there's always someone saying, "Well, this is not how we do stuff." Oh, this <laughs> is how we do stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do have you do have the you know the let's say the, the like lo, like Mo and Leo, for instance, the VFX supervisor that did Rogue One. So the, you get inputs from people, but I think for me, I think we're we're, we're now having conversations like this about costume and how people you know, where the costumes and how the costumes are important because it's Star Wars and because they keep telling us it's not sci-fi, it's Star Wars. Now, this is not sci-fi. Don't use that word. This is not sci-fi because it's vintage sci-fi, right. isn't it? Everything everything is lived in and believable and scratched. Like even the imperial side of the story, when you see now Zero there, if you look with kind of attention... So the, the walls are scratched. So they're not, of course, it's a completely different world from then when you jump to Ferrix that is warm and more organic and, and, and more brick like. And then you cut to this one is very dry and clean and etc. But it's, 
it's also part of the same universe where things are not supposed to be brand new. But for me, the best side of the story, I mean, in terms of like my work, is that everything was believable. Everything, nothing was just there because like, like, like Luke said, because it looked cool. You know, it's just there was a reason for every single prop, for the costumes, for how aged the costumes were, or for how new, brand new one this is. So there's always a, a story behind every single element brought in by, by Luke or by Michael or the prop department. It was just amazing to watch. You know, this, it's not sci fi. It really isn't. It's, it's something very different. It's just a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. So it's, it's really weird when you think, no, it's not in the future, right? This is somewhere in the past. Yeah, well, that's the, that's that kind of, um, you know, the, the dichotomy that exists, which is what I notice all the time, particularly in the sort of the, the set dressing and the props and the, the, the construction of the robots. It's, it's a combination of both old it's like the guy yeah, long yeah exactly galaxy you know far, far away and long and look you you shut me off if you don't if this is not supposed to be <laughs> aired it's just stuff that i heard for instance there's no uh doors no 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 hinges i noticed that there's a yeah. bunch of like rules no curtains it's, no wheels yeah, to like no gunpowder yeah but i think that comes for me that comes back to like it's like i you, Okay, this notion that I said to Tony right at the beginning, like uh, you don't need to patronize people about what Star Wars looks like or should look like. We've all grown yeah. up with it. We all, however much of a fan you are, you intrinsically have a sense of what that world is. So even for me, like, oh yeah, no, I know a door doesn't open like that in Star Wars. And it's like, you know, <laughs> things like that. And that is the rules you don't want to break. And then, and then you push or the other walls as far as you can to get as much right. out of them because <laughs> I, I don't know like yeah i did i think that is the case I, i'm not saying the other shows do this but i think there's a can become patronizing to fans and people who are new to it alike if you're constantly having to explain oh look this is a di we're in a different universe and actually what i'd rather do is like make you drawn in and watch it like you didn't realize you were and then something happens and oh yeah oh yeah we're in space <laughs> you know that's yeah. More yeah 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 exactly exactly well here <laughs> let me play a clip and then just i want to talk about the coordination between like on a technical level because a lot of our audiences like love the technical so adriano as i play this you can talk over it talk to me a little bit about first tell me a little bit about just the specific lens kit and the uh and the camera you use on the show and the aspect ratio and stuff like that but also the coordination on a set like this which is a sort of factory prison and i'll play it and you guys can talk over it a little bit um because again i think about this set this kind of white world but this is a massive set and tell me a little bit about you know how do you, how do you guys you and luke work together kind of create an environment that I suspect is fairly 360 for you to shoot in, Adriano. It was completely 360. I mean, there's a little bit of a kind of a ceiling uh, replacement, you know, VFX ceiling, because we could see that actually the, the, the rigging just above the end of the set. But, uh, well, basically, like I said, I chose early on to, to keep the C series, the, the uh, Planet Vision, the PVC series that Greg Fraser had used on, on um, Rogue One. He shot Rogue One on the Alexa 65. I, ch I chose to shoot it on the Venice in 4K. So it was anamorphic 4K um, only with the C-Series. Uh, um, I This is block four. I mean, this is the last block I shot, and there was a, the, the, the last block shot on the show on season one. Um, so there was... There was a little bit more, let's say, I, w I felt a little bit more experienced about the characters and the, 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 the sort of a v visual universe we were covering. Uh, there was, a, I mean, loads of conversations be about the butane lights around the walls and how much they had to change. There's, of course, you see the, then, then there's the riot moment when the lights goes off and the, or the power goes off. So we knew that we needed some, some like dramatic change to, to yeah. make it even more believable that goes to like emergency power or something. So that was basically my challenge throughout my prep was to find 
the number one sort of look and a couple different ones. So um, this, and, and, and then again, because it's all white and there's so much bounce, I mean, the other challenge for me was to be able to somehow for dialogues, for face-to-face, overshow the dialogues, to add a little bit of nag or just to be able to individually kill or, or alternate all the in, all in vision lights that you see now on the, on the clip. So they were, they were all individual, individually controlled. So whatever is not in camera would, I would probably turn off and then eventually just bring a little bit of nag. Uh, but it was a 360 environment. Uh, there's a little bit of a, a blue screen where you see the end of, there's a tunnel where they take the stars into. Once yes. the stars are ready, they put it on the rig and then they push it to the tunnel. So there was just a little bit of green screen down the tunnel. Everything else is, is uh, a physical set that we could work 360. We worked on that set for how long? Look, maybe three weeks or four weeks was a long run yeah. for us only for that set. Um, yeah. That- and, uh, it, with three cameras eventually because we had too many characters to cover. It was a two-camera show, I mean, throughout, with an additional third camera body or camera crew for, you know, complex uh, and uh, multiple faces sort of days. Um, But again, I think once you have a set that is that practical, you can shoot it very simply. I mean, we had normal, like, steady cam, dolly days. I mean, not, not much crane work for a set like this because we could use the, we could use the bridges. We could use the mezzanine. So all, everything was real. The lift was real that you see coming up and down. The, the, the mezzanine, um, tables were real. <laughs> Yeah, the, the doors that open on the yeah, second all, floor. Yeah, exactly. You, you, all of the, the yeah, the things have to sort of travel through space and lift and come down from the ceiling and all the all that stuff, right? That they have to work with. It's like a dance. It's like a choreography dance that they had to learn. Uh, and that massive. That, how do I call that, Luke? The massive. I don't know. I call it island. jumbotron, and it seems to stick. The, ju- the jumbotron, the massive floating island that it's above their heads was also, we could also lift it up and down to put it into frame or to lose it if when, we're, when we didn't want it. So it was just magical. The whole place was basically a big, big toy for all, for all of us to, to play with. It was just amazing. Yeah. And I love that, uh, just the lens choice that you did here in terms of constantly putting foreground and, and not being sort of inside of the of characters in clean singles, but more in this kind of overlapping people and this, which also I think really helps to give this first similitude of, of being sort and of also because uh, also Larry, I felt very kind of, uh, again, I, I have to use this word many times lucky, b- uh, because of the fact that uh, Disney and star Wars, they really, they really want to through the two, three, nine aspect ratio yeah. because that's not usually for the other big uh, streaming players. They don't like that because it's too narrow, or it's too squeezed, or whatever they say. Or the audience doesn't like it. There's too much, you know, the letterbox is too big, or whatever. But it, for the Star Wars uh, franchise, there's only one aspect ratio, and that's the one. So finally, I could use proper anamorphic lenses instead of just, you know, uh, using s- spherical and cropping or whatever the sure. final aspect. So uh, it was really nice. I mean, I really simplified. Uh, Greg Fraser had a much bigger kit. He also had the um, uh, Panatars that he shot in like 6K or whatever. I didn't want to carry too, too many different lenses and shooting two different uh, um, sensor sizes. So I basically stuck, I basically chose the C series and the um, the Venice in 4K, it, that really simplified the, the workflow, I mean, massively. But, you know, ha- working with two different units, uh, four, three different DOPs, I thought that by simplifying the workflow a little bit, everybody would benefit. And I think I was, I think it was a good choice. Uh, also, there was a, a thing about EPS 1, 2, and 3 that we also replied because it was the same director that apps one and two would be a little bit more smooth and uh, and more relying or betting more on Steadicam and Dolly work. And apps three is more handheld. 
and 8, 9, and 10 follow more or less the same grammar. So 8 and 9 are a little bit more stable and quiet. And then at 10, we jump straight to handheld to enhance the, the mayhem, basically. Yeah. Uh, Luke, in terms of building this set, sometimes the production designer can actually be basically effectively light the set for you. If it's, if it's coordinated correctly, it's like, it gives this incredible fluidity and this ability to see anywhere. If like the coordination between DP and designer can sort of say, how can we basically build the world and put, put units where they are, put them visibly in the shot. But, uh, yeah, no, I think it's, I don't know. It's, it's partly because it's Star Wars as well. I suppose I don't know, isn't it? Like we, a lot of the lighting is built into the sets because it, it kind of has to be, but yeah, uh, exactly. it's also a way I, design anyway i suppose like think about that first it's something we talked about a lot um i think we always probably wanted more <laughs> more flexibility more options but it was about di- different fields like you were saying like uh, it's it's finding something coherent across all of the seven worlds we're creating and uh, to tie them together and yet also finding um contrast between them uh, not just in color but also in in how they lit and, and how and how they're dressed and so so Ferrix needed to feel more, I don't know, sort of have a strong sense of uh, humanity uh, and collective culture. Uh, and, and, and whereas Coruscant almost has this kind of fascist monochromatic sterility. And then the prison for me was the brief I set myself in my own head was like it was a cross between an abattoir and a, and a laboratory clean room where the people right. were basically the thing that went through the mincing machine. And um, and so, you know, it was, I think when that prison started, it was, a, it was it's almost like inverting a panopticon. And, and then I, I think even Tony in his head was thinking it was going to be a grungy kind of jive in the prison. But, um, <laughs> but I never saw it that way. I always saw it as being very stark and very, they were building this thing and it was, it had to be clean and totally inhumane and you couldn't hide in it. Yeah. And it's also even like the introduction of that when they, when they come out of um, the sort of the, the transport ship and he's like, it's, just, it's amazing. We don't even have weapons. How do we not have weapons? And we're there. And then they show the power and he's like, that's one of three, you know, the fact that they're bare feet, and the, the and and the idea of just when they go to their um their their bedrooms at night in that the hallway and, and, and just the cells. like how 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 clean the environment is and how that was you know graphic and, and beautiful in a way of like its starkness um is and 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 yet it's even more like you know than than a dirty grungy prison it's even more sort of like uh the, the power they have over them and the fact that the number yeah. of things that are in there keeps changing. Let me start with Michael just talking through the design of the, the, the clothing in this environment, right? You know, in this world, let me just start on that first frame because to some extent, talk to me a little bit about the choices of, of just the, the, this, this, this level of, of people that exist. And I, I was really struck by the color. And the types of, you know, these factory workers, as I call them the below the line, as uh, Adriano said, uh, of, <laughs> of what was sort of going into uh, into this world and, and the people that exist within it. Well, this is our world of Ferrex. And for us, this was the very heart of the story. This is where it was a story about humanity and people working together for a common cause against um, oppression. And so for us, we just made sure we used the most... Um, the richest, most um, warm color palette. You know, it was an example of lots and lots of individuals. There was, unlike, it was the opposite of the prison. There was no repetition of things, which is extremely difficult when you're building costumes for Star Wars because all you want to do is like make 70 overalls and dye them different ways and break them down in different ways. But we created, I think, about 35 different elements between trousers, jackets, shirting, um, gear, aprons, tool belts, lots and lots of different elements to make sure that everyone felt like they had their own backstory. And I think when the camera moves through the alleys and the streets of Ferrix, you really kind of feel like everyone is an individual. There's no cookie cutter repetition. And they all have their own stories and their own families and their own businesses. Um, so we, we researched 
basically great workwear from all around the world. That's what I really love about Star Wars. You, That's cool. you always feel like part of their design approach is that drawing from the real world and then extrapolating into a Star Wars, a galaxy far, far away. And so when you think of like, you know, Queen Amidala, uh, even though it seems very exotic, it's actually kind of based quite clearly on Mongolian and, you know, Tibetan influences. And similarly for this, rather than just doing futuristic workwear, we looked at Japanese firefighters, we looked at Brazilian, you know, uh, miners, we looked at sort of workwear from all around the world, and then sort of put our own slant on things and used it to tell the story of this very um, communal um, society in Ferrix. So yeah, we, we created hundreds and hundreds of different uh, costume elements um, for this sequence. And Luke, in terms, of, I know we've gone through a bunch of frames just in this clip, but, you know, going back to that original, you know, the first shot here, mm -hmm. obviously there's some set extension, but the, your exterior work, you know, and there's quite a bit of it. Are you guys building this? Is this outdoors? Is this on stage? Is this, give me a little bit of, um, you know, because there's, there's, there's a bunch of, you know, other times in which, you know, we're seeing exteriors and fights in the exterior and all that. Tell me a little bit of the logistics and the specifics of how you built the ferric sort of exterior world. Yeah. Um, well, just starting with this image, everything is real <laughs> and physically there, apart from the middle of the bell tower, because actually we did build the top of it, but not in, in you know, in sense of it where it is now. So um, oh, if, wow. you, if you were to just bring your hand down over the top, I can't really do it, like down to where you yeah. see yeah, Exactly. Everything is there. We built that. So... And Even was, this, this is too far away. That's that, got to be a little that tiny little thing I can't actually see. On <laughs> but even this, I would have thought. I would have thought it ended. The here. lower level is the top the level. That, but, yeah. but, but basically, and there was kind of a reason for that because we kind of grew into it. We kind of kept adding and adding, and as we also knew what else it had to do. I mean, going into the start of the project, we had no idea that the whole thing would end in Ferrix. We were yes, one, exactly never going right. to go back there. <laughs> and then we and uh, so. Uh, but basically, to achieve a set like this, we, I mean, it's a, we called it the backlog, but really it was an old Thames water um, site in Marlow. It's basically just a bit of land. That if I showed you pictures of it now, you'd laugh. It's next to a reservoir. And we basically cleared it, flattened it, and built not only this set, the sort of this main street section, or we built the street, which is actually to the left of this, um, that goes into Marva's, which is a composite interior on this, and, and the hotel, which has a composite lobby on the end of the street. Then to the right of this, on the other side, we've got the the steps, the north steps, as we call it, which has a kind of loop back and around and has various interiors off it as well. So it was a kind of a whole composite of, I think it was about 30 or 32 sets, I think, that made up Ferrix, most of which were out on the back lot. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, and, and we did two different setups because obviously there's a good kind of time pass from when Cassian goes into prison and when he comes back and the Marvers died and, 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 the, and, the, and the funeral that turns into a riot. So, um, yeah, it's, it's mental, but it sort of ends up paying for itself in a weird kind of way rather than trying to split it into the stages. And, uh, so, and, then, and then, Adriano, are you, what are you doing as far as light control? Are you trying to... I mean, I've, you know, I've certainly done some, some little bit of this and I know how arduous to exterior can be for a director of photography. Um, are you got, you know, you, I assume, you know, you, you're, you have to have some protection for, you know, overheads and controlling the light. Yeah. Are you extending the height of buildings for the shadows or are they effectively shadowing themselves from the reality of the, height that Luke built. Give me a little yeah, insight I mean, into this. Specifically for this frame we see now, that's just the sun on the left-hand yeah. side. So the shadow you see on the floor, that's the real sun. But there were, I mean, a couple big, you know, uh, cherry pickers, big massive machines with 20 buys. There was a 20 by 40 feet massive flag for negative to also because again we had to pretend the some of the buildings were higher than they yes, were actually exactly. were uh so that was the main uh, kind of work for some days they exteriors like 
that you see. Um, but also we shot in Ferrix some, I mean, a lot of interiors. Like there's a bar on the left hand side. Yeah. You know, Marvel is, is on the same back lot. It was the same. Oh, like, it's like same. inside outside sets. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Inside outside. I mean, a lot. The the two the two ladies that you actually see watching. Uh, the conversation it, it, it's actually being physically there like I said it's like, like a location it's this just physical here, yeah. we, 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 we shot this dialogue and just across the, the street there's a, a, a tiny door where they actually are watching that conversation so inside and outside so there's a little bit of a lighting help some uh, probably a sky panel coming through that window we see on the background same thing here but again trying to keep things as um I mean, my, I think my goal is make things, they, they shouldn't look lit. I mean, that's the, they should look real and believable. So it's, that's basically, it's the window. So my explanation, I mean, to myself in terms of finding, finding the level of realism I want to be working on, is it, I believe this? I mean, do I believe this is just daylight coming through windows? And so I just tr really try to keep it very simple. I mean, this is a very simple scene on a very narrow set. And I, really like you know the the look and the way yeah, we, we jump from one set to another yeah so we just it was try to keep very simple but you know there's a lot of talent involved on <laughs> on, <laughs> on all if every single frame you see you know makeup yeah, I mean, this and frame, motion, it's just amazing yeah yeah the edge light and the sort of the level at which you set the scene is gorgeous i wonder if this is just it could have just been a hot spot across the thing or was it something you brought in the ever little highlight you have for her is just so lovely in this frame. Oh, I am, I am obsessed about the highlights. Yeah, exactly. Like, so, am, what's yeah. your what's your technique uh, in general, but also specifically for sets? Because this is something every day we try to figure out. Is like, how do you add an highlight that doesn't add exposure? Because you want it to not, you know, bring up the fill, but it also has enough value to really see it on the camera. Like, I think if you go through the scene, you see there's a window behind. The brunette lady, and there's that door, yes, right? Exactly. They walk, they so, walk that has so when that, you right. so when you cut around, so basically, I had the door behind camera here. So yes. I, 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 that's a little this is a little different. But when I had the door behind the camera, yes. I, Larry, if I can remember all these circumstances, but I I think basically what we did, I think I went, I tried a negative first. And I tried to add a source, a tiny bit of a, a tiny source. Then it didn't work because it looked sourcey. So I think what I did is I did, I, lo I lost the source. I lost an egg and I just silked the door itself. There you go. Because it was a cloudy, it was a cloudy day. Yeah. So it wasn't really bright outside. So it was just a, it was just a matter of making it less bright on the foreground and just make the wind. Uh, the window win so be, so the window the backlight turns into the key light right that's the i think that's one of my yes i know exactly strategies yeah yeah, Strategy. yeah that's great yeah, yeah. that's great yeah. um hey i noticed in this scene this is maybe what you guys were talking about before where you're like there are no curtains I like this little thing here where you guys, it's like, <laughs> it's a great little thing. Cause you go, well, wait a second. Everyone needs to stop the light from coming to a spot in their, in their and, house. And it's yeah. Actually it's a dialogue thing as well. Cause he says, yeah. about he's cold and he, she can't afford to turn the heat. On, you know? <laughs> the whole point is when you come back, they're all down and yeah, like anything, you want a bit of texture to come through them as well. But yeah, they're like roller blinds. The ones to the left of them on the wall are like padded ones. The idea is like some sort of th thermal <laughs> padding on the inside of the home um but that's, i wonder uh, in the in and, and forgive me for getting his exact name but uh their robot which i kept thinking how is it in 2022 we don't have i know we have alexas and whatever the things that are hang listen to everything we say in our house but why don't we have these already these are so cute and lovely and they've existed now for 45 years in star wars this feels like a real shame that we don't have a little robot that uh, is our friend, like a little puppy dog. I'm just trying to figure out if you need a doctor or not. She has pain in the knee. Uh, but those, you know, from like JJ's, uh, you know, BB-8 or whatever, and, and the original R2-D2, what's the design? Is this, I always wonder like what things, because they become such important elements to like a new franchise. 
when you develop, you know, that robot, what's the process of that? Because, you know, obviously they then become toys that kids want to buy and I want one to be in my house. Uh, tell me a little bit. I, cause he, he obviously he's it's got the, so much character and his little stutter and yeah, all of it. Um, it's different. I mean, like Neil Scanlan makes them and his team essentially design them, gotcha. but with B2, I don't know, I guess it, 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 some of them are more involved with than, than others. So like some of them obviously already exist, so there's no, nothing to say. But uh, B2, I always said it needed to feel like a kind of Rubik's Cube toolbox that was their pet dog. So <laughs> the idea between for the original one I sketched out was that his middle, and we kind of have it in there, but there was a lot more going on. Obviously, it's a cost factor to this. Like the idea was that kind of all these different bits kind of twisted around. So you could like every time here was one combination, it opened a door and it uh, gave another tool or it gave another thing or it did this. And that was the kind of concept around his kind of column. Um, and uh, and then there was a lot of talk about what color he should be. And this is this is a good example of where they, um, you know, people who've done a lot of Star Wars before, they kind of did a lot of palettes that were very classic Star Wars. And I was just like, yeah, no, he should be red. <laughs> It's, it's like it kind of just happens like that or you know and then someone does the concert and goes oh yeah okay it's great um and then obviously i mean actually with b2 even more so he came to life when neil's team started making him i mean when they like the technology actually it just in the base of that thing is quite incredible like the remote control of it is uh and then they had the speaker in it as well didn't they adriana so he could actually talk yeah kind of the actors in the room uh, yeah, I said, that must be great. Well, the fact that also that the top of his, you know, the, the top of his yeah, head tilts, tilts has so much. I mean, it's literally like it's a character and it has a, you, it says things without even words, just with its, with that little tilt of its head. Uh, it's really, really brilliant. And again, it's the level of like three dimensional depth to these environments and with your, obviously your department, the dressing and all that. But even that, I kept thinking, yeah, nothing like what I said with Michael and every piece of clothing. It's, yeah, you can't just go to Ikea and buy some of these things. No. Um, <laughs> no, like, it's uh, it's, it's so like every little bit has to be thought out. Every little, you know, piece. Every of single thing like, is alarmingly designed. Yeah, the cup, when they're when they're having a, a, you know, she's having some tea or whatever she's having in this scene. I, it was like, oh, yeah, that's that's somebody, you know. I, I know these are obvious things. I've worked in the movie business for 30 years. It's the only job I've had. And yet I'm still in sort of, I still marvel at all the detail and all the things that have to go into every frame and all the, the stuff that as if I've never even seen a movie set. Uh, and this, for some reason, the show, I was even more sort of in tune to it in a, in a really incredible way. I think I'm really excited to do it. I mean, like Rebecca, who's my set decorator on this, uh, Rebecca Alloway, like her team are amazing. I mean, like literally, like you say, it's not just the sets that are designed. It's every piece of furniture, every chair, every, you know, there wasn't really anything that ever comes in and you go, oh, look, yeah, we just use it as it is. It's, it's great. <laughs> There's like a very few, few things. I um, mean, there are some good locations out there as well where you go, that looks really Star Wars, but then whatever you do, you end up building into it or creating or adding something. And uh, actually, this is this Chandrillion as a, I think as a, I took it away, but yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, all right, well, we're going to end this after this clip, but wait, I, this is the clip I'm looking for. Okay, good. Well, well, but I'm going to have Michael lead this one off. I, I just talk to me a little bit about the inspiration and, and what would be the aristocracy of, of Star Wars, you know? This was a really exciting um, a, a sequence for us to do because it was a glimpse into a sh the Chandrillan culture. So Mon Mothma and her family are from a planet called Chandrilla. This is their embassy on Coruscant. And so it's a planet that we've never been to before on Star Wars. So it was great talking to Luke uh, and Adriano about, you know, what the elements of Chandrillan culture are, what the colors were, what the sort of graphics were. Um, and we sort of settled on this very specific um, palette of um, lots of pale colors, oystery, neutrals, um, lots of metallic accents and things. So that sort of gives this kind of unified vibe to, to these scenes at the embassy. Uh, and but as well as the Chandrillan members, we have um, the senators and the movers and shakers of Coruscanti 
culture. And so we have lots of different opportunities for great um, background characters to be um, to be created there. So uh, myself and my team uh, created a world of um, Coruscant. I guess um, evening wear pieces. They they don't exist at the IKEA Star Wars uh, stores. <laughs> we, we had to get a act together and create. Um, I think we we had a great time. It took us months to do, but we created like I think again like a modular thing of maybe fifty or so different designs that we made in different fabrics uh, and then with different details. So each piece is different from the next. We had a whole department making jewelry. We had a whole department making headwear and millinery. Um, the dress that Mon Mothma wears here is a, um, a very, I guess, unusual sculptural design that sort of speaks of her very sophisticated, worldly, um, uh, you know, planet that she comes from. And um, she's an incredibly intelligent and uh, wealthy character that is leading this double life of being, you know, a, a um, concerned senator, but is also on the knife's edge, um, you know, trying to fund the fledgling rebel um alliance so um so she yes she often she like so many of the characters in this series they they have disguises they have double lives you're wondering who the real version of this character was so as a costume designer that was really fun to to play with that many different versions of the character luthan is luthan i think is another good example of this we see so many different versions of that character that we're really left scratching our head like who is the real Luthan? What's he running away from? What are his motivations? What are his background? What's his, who are his alliances with? So I think all of these things with costume, you can kind of give the audience subtle little uh, signifiers to, to, to sort of give them some background um, information about all of these characters. And, and Luke, what were some of the conversations about this specific environment? Uh, obviously, again, it still has some of the, sort of modern technical, you know, the, the LED ribbon lights that sort of provide the accents and the architectural lighting to sort of define the structures of, of you know, environments within here, but also the kind of lattice work that exists sort of on the left-hand side of the frame. Talk to me a little bit about, you know, because yeah. I, I don't... Yeah, this is obviously a new environment we haven't seen before. No, no, not. And also it's kind of as if it with Tony Singh's layered with like story. So you kind of, it's not their home. It's like a place. Yes, the exactly. That other Chandrillion senators would have stayed in pre previously. So it's not personalized. It's almost a little bit like uh, awkward. That's why I don't know. I love that. I love, I love dinner table scenes anyway, but I love the massive table that we put in there across with the view out. It's this kind of yes. idea of power. And yet still there's this dysfunctional family. <laughs> so, um, but the screens, the whole notion of the screens was a, a, like, um, to create a set basically that you could break open for the parties and have very fluid kind of conversations through it and then shut down for like this stressful breakfast scene with her daughter. Um, and that, yeah, no, and still get the texture of the rest of the set through it. I mean, a lot of conversations, I mean, in my head, probably mainly, but like how we can like get this sort of idea of Star Wars lighting built into the set that doesn't feel like a spaceship, but also doesn't feel Star Trek. It's very easy to step, step over into that. That I think it was Adriano said it earlier, because we are not sci-fi, we're sort of a space fantasy, I suppose. Um, and it's, it's finding... Oh, God, yeah, that level of reality of, like, you know, I mean, this very normal thing. She's hosting a party in her sort of penthouse Chandrillion embassy pad, uh, and at the same time, it's got to feel Star Wars and and, and also very human, human about it. Um, but I never wanted it to feel like it was her home. Or if we did, we suggested the home was upstairs or something like that. So every uh, aspect of it had a sort of, I don't know... Um, you're renting this place. You're, you're not, you're not, this is not something where you bought in your own home. I mean, like if we ever went to Chandrilla, we would see the contrast between the two, because I think that would be interesting. And that's something that I did sort of start to think about in my head, but like, sorry, Ash, yeah, <laughs> I, was, I don't know what I'm no, talking about. No, I, I was no. going to say that also just for, as an illustration, this is the only, you correct me, Luke, this is the only set we actually had, something like the volume or like an led 
yeah, extension. We had any, yeah, we had so so yeah. that is the I think is the the only set we had a bit massive LED panel to extend the set. So the city and you know the city lights you see the skylights yeah, you see course, on the background. Yeah. It was actually there on the day, which is amazing as well, because you don't get the the blue green or the blue spill or the green spill back onto your set. So it was really, really the best use of the LED technology. You know, the the big LED panels. Well, that's like what yeah, what Luke said about it being in house in camera VFX, which I think actually is sort of the when you're not doing full volume work that you've written for I, I Mandalorian. The, just having that technology to not shoot blue screen is is incredible. Yeah, I think that yeah. is fundamentally like a game changer in the most you know the last six or seven years for sure to have that that possibility. Um, I, I always wonder because these scenes have such fluidity, Adriana, and I is again, are you doing this with some sort of like you know ceiling removed top soft light that can allow this kind of because these scenes well, the, are really lovely where you travel through all these places and there's all this, you know, you're not setting lights on stands, you know, seemingly. Almost uh, almost nothing. Well, again, I think my goal was to make believe that the, the big white chandeliers you see on this uh, yes. frame were basically lighting the whole environment. I mean, I didn't have a big one around the bar where the, where the scene actually starts. So I had to mimic it somehow with a couple gem balls and a couple sky panels, uh, because it's it's also not fluid in terms of uh, the way they move. But it's that that scene specifically starts with a kind of a long, steady come Warner that takes us to the daughter. So it's a kind of also a very fluid sort of blocking in a sense. It's not action adventure in any way. I mean, it's very classic. We are in. Coruscant now, everything is supposed to be more formal and and elegant. So, you know, there's no rush. There's not it's not supposed to be cutty. So of course all conversations we had throughout prep, you know, the differences in terms of grammar for Ferrix, for Coruscant, for you know, the prisons, different episodes, and then the episodes that Frank Lamb shot in Scotland for the the, the heist, they, that that we used to call that the, the blue planet where things go from especially when you finish on block one, that is such a warm, visually warm episode with all the terracottas and, and, and browns and yellows, then suddenly you jump to another planet, everything seems to be a little bit bluer. So we had conversations in terms of like how to enhance the difference between planets and, and sets and uh, and at this one, the embassy is so beautifully, beautifully kind of monochromatic and gentle. So the, the camera moves and the overall grammar should reflect that in a sense and how also how gentle her character is how, the way she speaks and you know and all the the diplomacy involved so it's somehow we try to punctuate what the script is suggesting in terms of like uh, characters um uh moods and modes and and also the sets and the different planets that we had to travel to and i think that as i think now i mean overall when you watch the series there's a lot of variety in terms of even like, they're all very gentle and monochromatic but there's a lot of um variety in terms of like colors and tones and this one again it's you know part of the same world in Coruscant, so it's very you know well what a cool uh super cool ceiling uh choice yeah here. i thought this was really really incredible this the ceiling is is awesome. It's amazing. <laughs> it was amazing to see when when we. I keep calling them locations, but it is right like stepping <laughs> on a location. Yeah, yeah. This is a very, very, very beautiful, uh, beautifully done. And again, Rich you know, in his gallery, in which you know he has all these artifacts and every you know, single place. art piece in his gallery was created by Rebecca <laughs> and her team and Luke. It's uh, it's unbelievable. It really yeah, is unbelievable how rich amazing. the whole thing is. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, uh, I really can't think, thank you guys enough. The show is incredible. Uh, if you haven't seen it, watch it first and then listen to this or vice versa. You're going to, you're going to love it. And it's really human. It, it's, it's it, Diego Luna's character is, is, is really complex. 
he starts almost a bit of a coward and, 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 and an individual and he really grows into something much more. And, uh, it's, it's a wonderful show. And it sounds like you guys are making a season two, which is great. And, uh, and you guys, are, uh, just, you know, the best of the best. And, uh, you did great work on this show and I look forward to seeing you guys, what you guys do next. So thank you for joining us on this shot talk and, uh, thank and, you. Uh, always, always good seeing you. And, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the next 20 minutes of this game. Maybe Messi gets it. Maybe Messi finally gets a World Cup. We'll see. Uh, Thanks, Larry. Thank you. Thank what you. What a pleasure. Nice to meet you.